this is my first time at the IABC. My name is Jordan Rummel. I'm a sophomore at Emerson College. I'm a political communication major, which means that pretty soon you'll be seeing me on MSNBC or CNN, uh, at least I hope. And this year I was actually working with Dr. Payne. He's a political communications professor at Emerson College. He teaches courses such as argument and advocacy and public diplomacy, which are two that I'm enrolled in. In addition to that, I actually did a direct study with Dr. Payne which is a one-on-one -on -one course that we would meet bi-weekly. And we would discuss the, the actual emphasis on this course that we did was Kent State University, the shootings that happened on May 4th, 1970. And one thing, you know, while we're talking about that, one of, you know, naturally we kind of went into rebellion, we went along to dissent, and kind of what that means as a, as a citizen, kind of are we able to dissent, what is the government's response? And one thing we talked about was a behavioral directive. And a behavioral directive is when one person or an entity or a group of people says something in order to get an intended response. It's targeted messaging. For example, if I were talking to Janice here and I said, Janice, you're really great. I think it's time to take our relationship to the next level. I love you. Mm -hmm. You would say, silence. That's kind of like my, how my last relationship ended. <laughs> but, but, but the intended messaging that I'm trying to get across is the intended response would be, I love you too. That's kind of how behavioral directive works. And so another example I can kind of give maybe on a broader scale is McDonald's has had a pretty successful advertising campaign. So if you know the second half of this, I'd really appreciate it if you could uh, say it out loud with me. So that a lot of the commercials go, ba da ba 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 I love it. Exactly, we all know that because we all, that message is burned into our brains. We know that we love McDonald's because of that commercial. And this behavioral directive is actually applied, you know, not just in advertising, not just personal communication, but from the government down to the people. And this is really, uh, um, this is really, we, we see this a lot in propaganda. We see this a lot when the government is want to influence the public's opinion on certain issues. And we see it at Kent State, which is what I'm going to talk about a little bit later. And but through history, we've seen these behavioral directives. Uh, Joseph McCarthy, the um, 40s and 50s, with the whole McCarthyism, the whole Red Scare talking about, you know, you're, you're a communist in Congress, accusing other people of having certain viewpoints. And whether we knew it or not, as a nation, the public gets influenced by him doing this. He's a public elected official, and so anything he says, you know, any actions that he takes, we are, you know, even subtly or subconsciously going to acquire some of those viewpoints. Also, I have a quote that I'm going to read off from another influential leader in history, and it goes, the universities are filled with students rebelling and rioting. Communists are seeking to destroy our country. Russia is threatening us with her might, and the republic is in danger. Yes, danger within and without. We need law and order. And that was actually Hitler in 1932. <coughs> and you know, to say that he's one of the most terrible people is a vast understatement, but we can still appreciate him uh, as a speaker and for the rhetorical strategies he used, because he was a genius in that regard. He knew how to get public opinion on his side. And as we, as we know, not too long after 1932, Hitler rose to power and World War II and the rest is history. Um, but then also, uh, you know, 36 years later from this quote, another president used the same kind of messaging. And that was President Nixon coming into office. He wanted to establish law and order in a time where the students were rebelling and there was dissent in the country. So the country, you know, leading up to you know, Nixon taking office and kind of uh, the moment where everyone remembers is when he announced the surge in Cambodia. So April 30th, that's kind of the tipping point. But the era leading up to that, you know, USA was very divided on the issue of Vietnam. Students were protesting, they were unhappy about having to go to the war, they were burning their draft cards. And um, Nixon, you know, one of the uh, behavioral directives that he used was he called these student protesters bums. He kind of dehumanized the students and brought them down. So again, from a public perspective, this is like an us versus them mentality. If you're not one of the students, and you hear the president calling these student rebellions, these student uh, protesters bums, you're naturally gonna kind of assume that position. Whether you know it or not, whether you fully believe it, it's still in your mind. That's the highest leadership of the land call these protesters bums. Also, it was coming from the vice president, Spiro Agnew, and he was telling police uh, when dealing with protesters to imagine that they were wearing brown or white sheets and act accordingly. Whether or not that actually advocates violent activity, that's kind of debatable, but it's still aggressive rhetoric, it's still aggressive language, and still he was, tar like, he was using targeted language in order to kind of get a response and kind of shape public opinion. So clearly tensions were high 
leading up to May 4th. Now before we talk about the actual weekend of May 4th, I'd like to talk about Kent State a little bit, just so there's a little bit of background. These kids at Kent State at the time were atypical of the rest of the country. These were not protesting kids. They did not really share the same rational viewpoint. In fact, in a poll leading up to, the, to May 4th, had less than half of the student body wanted uh, immediate withdrawal from Vietnam. And about 54% actually supported the Vietnamization program. So this was a student body that was totally in favor, not totally, but was more in favor of the Vietnam program than kind of the rest of the country at the time. There was some minor SDS activity, uh, but nothing serious. Probably the most notable event on campus leading up was Jerry Rubin gave a speech. Uh, he was a radical speaker at the time. And he actually told the students to, that in order for change to actually occur, they need to go get their guns and kill their parents. And of course, he did not actually mean shoot your parents. The kind of metaphor he's kind of getting across is we have to rise up. The old generation doesn't know what's best anymore. But again, this is aggressive rhetoric. It was in the heads of the students. So leading into May 4th, when this, all this activity went down, uh, it's possible that this was another behavioral directive kind of uh, producing there, the student behavior. And all culminated on the weekend of May 4th. So the Friday before that was May 1st, and I'm just gonna give you guys a short timeline kind of of what went down this weekend so it's a little more clear. And on May 1st, about 500 students gathered on the Kent State Commons, and they buried a piece of paper torn out of a textbook of the Constitution. So this was a symbolic moment for these 500 students at Kent State. Not a huge group by any means, but a small but significant amount. And then later that night, it was Kent Friday, they went into town, these kids were at the bars, you know, just doing their usual Friday night things, when a motorcycle gang, known was the Chosen Few, showed up. And they started riding their motorcycles outside, they lit a bonfire, there was dancing, and it kind of got out of hand. There was some destruction of property, but again, this was the motorcycle gang, not the students. That night, however, the mayor declared a state of emergency in response to this activity, closed all the bars, kicked all the students out of the bars, so now you have a hostile, angry group of students that have been kicked out of their Friday night activity and they're now out in the streets. They're mad. So that's kind of the Friday night. Then on Saturday, the National Guards called into Kent State without the Kent State. Kent State University didn't know about this, but the National Guard is now in Ohio and ready to go. And then there was also the burning of the ROTC building on campus. The way this happened was during the day, a bunch of students went to the ROTC building, tried to burn it in kind of a protest, building was made of tin, that didn't work very well, you can't burn that. They, so the students leave, and then a, but then an undetermined amount of time later, the building ignites. And still nobody really is sure who burned the building down. But all we know is the students were no longer there when the burning lit up. The firemen are called, the National Guard comes in, they kind of control the scene again. One student's bayoneted, and it's kind of a violent scene. So that's, that is now a Saturday, that's all Saturday. Then on Sunday, Governor Rhodes, Governor of Ohio, he's running for re-election in his primary, and so he's giving a press conference kind of on this whole issue, because now the city of Kent, Ohio, is kind of worried what's going on, this is a lot of activity. And in his press conference, he says that we need to eradicate the problem at Kent. He uses the word eradicate, which again, I think is another behavioral directive. He's using this harsh rhetoric, this aggressive language to kind of indicate a position and the activity he wants to happen. He also calls the students at Kent the worst type of people, which dehumanizes them, much the same way that Nixon called the students bums. If you're not part of this situation, and he's calling these students the worst type of people, that's just an attitude you're gonna take on, subconsciously or not. At night, the students come out to the commons, um, they're again, they're hanging out, and then a curfew is enforced by the National Guard. They set up like an 845 curfew, which the students are not happy about, because this is their campus, they don't know why the National Guard is there, they're very clearly frustrated, but the National Guard again, they enforce this, they get pushed the students back, and that's the end of that night. So this all leads up to Monday, which is May 4th, and a large group of students gather on the commons. They're now, this is now, this was a protest for a different event, but it's kind of turned into this bigger movement. Now the National Guard has been doing all this stuff to them at night. And the, the grows and grows and grows, and then about 12.20 in the afternoon, and this is very abbreviated, but it's kind of the National Guard members, and those, several members of the National Guard turn in unison, fire into the students, kill four and injure nine. And that's kind of what has been the, the legacy of May 4th, I can, for these students that were killed. Now the response to these shootings 
from the public was very positive. The public uh, was in complete favor of the guard, absolved the guard of any blame, and actually thought that the students kind of had what was coming to them, like they deserved it. This was sort of, they brought this upon themselves. Additionally, letters were sent to the families of the killed children, hundreds of letters, and the majority of them were, you know, your daughter deserved to die, she was just a, she was a bum, she wasn't, she was protesting, she's not American. So again, this was just the public, and this was all they knew to do, kind of from the behavioral directives of the leadership. That's kind of the point I'm trying to drive here. And Nixon and Rhodes and Rubin, as I mentioned earlier, they all, they're the leadership of this time, so anything they say, the public's gonna be influenced by. There was really no alternative for the public in terms of how they were going to act. It was almost predetermined by them, by the government. And we still have this behavioral directive today, uh, whether we know it or not, kind of I mentioned in the beginning with McDonald's, Sarah Palin recently went on a spree in Congress calling certain congressmen un-American for their views, or calling certain sections of the country, this is pro-America, this part of the country is pro-America. And again, we, as the public, we witness her doing this kind of activity, and we, you know, even if you don't agree with what she's saying, you're gonna see that what she is calling pro-American, get a certain idea about maybe those people in your own mind, that's gonna influence the way you behave and act. Additionally, the new movie Olympus Has Fallen, I don't know how many of you are familiar with it, has Morgan Freeman. Um, it's about the White House being attacked, and this is by, and the enemy in the film are North Koreans. And many people have speculated, and Dr. Payne actually uh, told me about this idea that he was having, is that this is a new wave of kind of Hollywood priming us for a possible attack of North Korea. If they're the enemy now in multiple films, it's not gonna be as bad for America. We're not gonna object to a war with North Korea. We're not gonna care as much. They'll dehumanize them. This is much the same way we saw in the Cold War era. You know, Indiana Jones was always against the Soviet Union. James Bond always was against Russian spies. And that kind of dehumanized them in case of any additional attack. In terms of what we can do, I don't think that it would be right for us to combat these behavioral directives. I don't think that we can eliminate them because I think they're present in everything we do. The president in the speech I'm giving to you right now, I'm shaping the way you think even subtly. And I think what we can do is become more aware of them and just be, be able to recognize them when we see them so we're not believing everything we hear and not being influenced by 